We are now known by the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, eagerly maintaining the unity of the Spirit and united as the Church, the body of Christ, made new in the fullness of his love, because in Christ all things are made new. I love that because everything sounds better with a British accent. Um, hey, it is great to be together this morning. Uh, welcome to those of you who are here in the sanctuary. If you're watching online, welcome. Glad you've joined us uh, in that way. Uh, we, I, I can think of nothing better than to be gathered here this morning to worship God together. I've really enjoyed it so far, and I just want to let you know I love being a part of this church. So it's great to get to open God's Word with you this morning. Uh, we have been in the book of Ephesians the letter of Ephesians for uh, the whole fall season, really, since early September. And we, uh, we are getting there. We're not only preaching through Ephesians, we are doing Ephesians in community groups, and many are doing Ephesians in their own personal quiet time. It's like Ephesians, your eyes out right now. But it's been a wonderful thing. It's been such a growing experience for, uh, I think, for us as a church. And so we are on chapter five now, and it only goes through six chapters. So that means we're on the home stretch, all right? So Ephesians chapter five, verses one to 21 is where we'll camp out today. Um, so you can turn there if you have your Bibles, but uh, while you're doing that, I wanna, I wanna remind you, I hope I don't have to remind you that this is Steelers week for the Browns. All right, so as Browns fans, this is a big day for us. And I, uh, I w want you to know, I, you already know this, I'm a big Browns fan, and it's rubbed off on my uh, seven-year-old son, Griffin. And it's rubbed off in such a way that he, I mean, he is all in with the Browns. And there is one thing that you know when you're all in with the Browns, there's one thing that's always true. It's that you want nothing to do with the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> and nothing. And I don't know where he, he, he's picked up on this, I don't know where he got it from, but... <laughs> Um, but it's funny, he's taken it to a whole new level. So just recently he found out that the Browns play at Heinz Field. And so he realized that that's the same Heinz as like Heinz ketchup and mustard and all the things that they make. So he has boycotted eating all of Heinz products <laughs> because it's Heinz Field. That's where the Steelers play. Now, it, it doesn't get any more all in than that for the Browns. But listen, we're going to open our Bibles to this passage today, and here's what, I, here's what the truth of that passage is. It says that when you understand just what Christ has done for you, you go all in for Jesus. And when you go all in for Jesus, you want nothing to do with anything that is not of Jesus. And that's kind of what we see in this passage. So let's open our Bibles, or you can follow along on the screen, to Ephesians 5. We're going to read... Verses 1 to 21, it's a pretty big section of Scripture. Here we go. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints." Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience." Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible." For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit." 
addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay, that is God's word for us today, and we're going to unpack that now. The sermon today is entitled A New Walk, New Walk. And we're going to answer two questions uh, for this sermon. And here are the two questions. The first one is, why do you walk with Jesus? Then the second one is, how do you walk with Jesus? So why do you walk with Jesus? And how do you walk with Jesus? The first question is, why do you walk with Jesus? And you have to have the answer to this question before you can move on to the next question. And it is answered in verses, in the first two verses. So let me read verses one and two again. It says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That second verse is one of the most concise and simple ways to describe what it means to be a Christian. It really is. It just says very simple, very simply, walk in love. Why? Because Christ loved us and gave himself for us. You you can teach your four-year-old that. They can get it. That's what it means to be a Christian. So why do we walk with Jesus? Why do we walk in love? Because Christ loved us and he gave himself for us. And we have to not miss this because if we miss this, we'll miss the rest of the passage. And here's what we need to know. You will never be motivated to do what God wants you to do unless you understand what God has already done for you. You will never be motivated to do what God wants you to do unless you understand what God's already done for you. Right? That's what you need to know. Now, I want to give us um, a little bit of a visual of this before we go on any further. And I'm going to take us back to the, to the Old Testament in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 37. Uh, here's what goes on. Ezekiel is a prophet of God, and God gives Ezekiel uh, some visions. And one of the visions that God gives Ezekiel is that he he takes him in this vision to this valley of dry, decaying human bones. And he takes him to this valley and looks, it's it's like a battle graveyard where there's just bones. They're not bodies, they're not corpses. They are bones. They've been there that long. I'm sorry to be morbid, but that's just the way it is. And he goes, Ezekiel, do you think these bones can be made alive? And Ezekiel says, well, only you know, and only you can do that. And so God says, Ezekiel, here's what you're going to do. You're going to prophesy over these bones, and they are going to come alive. And long story short, Ezekiel does what God says, and he sees in this vision, he sees these bones make a skeleton, turn into a live skeleton, and then there are are muscles and tendons and ligaments that come onto these bones and then skin covers these bones and the Bible says and then they they are alive and somebody answer that phone and then they are standing they are standing on two feet right in front of them and they are alive they were dead they were decaying bones and now they have been made alive and it is a wonderful, wonderful vision and story that is shared there. But do you know that that's that's your story if you know Jesus? That's your story. That's my story if you know Christ as your Savior. And look at it. We've got to go back. Stacy mentioned it earlier. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 says this, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, A pile of decaying bones made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. We have to understand. The reason I go back and emphasize this again is because the rest of this passage, Paul is telling us how we should live as believers, and we are never going to understand the rest of this passage if we don't first understand that we were dead and we've been made alive. The rest of this passage, if you don't get that, it will just seem like legalism. It'll seem like a list of rules that God's trying to to put on us to make our lives difficult. That's not what this is. You have to first understand that you were dead and now you're alive. Imagine, 
Imagine those uh, running into one of those guys who used to be bones in the valley, and you run into them the week la- a week later, and they are just on fire for God. And you look at them, you're like, why are you so happy? Why are you doing all this great stuff for the Lord? And they look at you, and, they, and that, that guy looks at you and goes, no, you don't even understand. A week ago, my legs weren't even attached to my body. And now I am standing on two feet with life in me. I will do anything that God wants me to do. Because if it is God that has made me alive, then I will do whatever he tells me. I will live however he tells me to live. And so here is the truth for us before we go any further. You will never walk the way that God wants you to walk unless you understand how much God has given up just to put you on your two feet. And so you were dead, you've been made alive, you were placed on your two feet, and the only thing left to do is walk. And Paul says, here's how you walk, the rest of the passage. So we know why we're supposed to walk, But then now we're going to talk about how we walk with Jesus. And that's the rest of this passage. And there are are three ways that uh, we walk with Jesus that Paul mentions very clearly in here. I didn't creatively find these. Here they are. We walk in love, we walk in light, and we walk in wisdom. They're all right here. Okay, so the first one, we walk in light, love, wisdom. First one is actually love. I mixed that up. Love, light, wisdom. First one's love. So let's look at verse two again. Paul says, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Okay, so we're supposed to walk in love. Do you want to know how you're doing as a Christian? You want to know the test for how you're doing as a Christian? How you doing with loving others? How good at you, how good are you right now at loving others? Because loving others is the only unmistakable mark of true Christians. It's love. And it's going to happen. And that's why there's a famous passage in 1 Corinthians 13, and it's all about love. But listen to the first few verses of 1 Corinthians 13. It says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Do you want to know what it looks like to be a Christian? It's not about how many times you go to church. It's not about how well you know the Bible. It's not about how much you give. It's not about how much you serve. It's not about how much you sacrifice. It's not even about how many people you lead to Jesus. All those things are really, really good. But what the passage says is that if you do all those things, but you can't love anyone ever, if you, if you can't love at all, then you miss it all. You gain nothing. Because love always has been and always will be the unmistakable mark of Christians. And so if love is not a pattern in your life right now, if it's not a consistent pattern in your life, my challenge to you is this. Don't try harder. What you need to do is go back and understand the gospel in a deeper way. You need to go back and reflect on exactly what Christ has done for you and allow his love for you to move you towards loving others more. You can't manufacture love, but love is a natural outcome when we experience God's unconditional love for us. It just is. That's, and there's a reason why Paul says, walk in love. He says, walk in love because he is saying, walking is like one of the most routine everyday things that most of us do. For most of us, walking is a very natural thing that we do day in and day out. And so what Paul is saying is, he's not saying every once in a blue moon, make sure you do something to show love to someone. That's not what Paul's saying. He's saying your love should be like a lifestyle. 
It should be a daily routine where it's a pattern in your life. Paul doesn't say love. He says walk in love. He doesn't say sprint in love. He doesn't say uh, do flips in love. He doesn't even say do cartwheels in love. The reason I say cartwheels is this. My daughter is, uh, can do a killer cartwheel. She's five. Her name's Kenzie. If I had brought her up here she, and she did a cartwheel, you'd be like, that cartwheel looks like it's good and it looks pretty natural to her. She makes it look easy. How many of you make a cartwheel look easy? Yeah. Uh, Maybe if you're a gymnast, but I'd venture to say by your laughs that not many of you do. Right, do you want, you want to see, see a cartwheel? All right, I'm going to do a cartwheel. Um, I, I'm going to do a cartwheel. This is my last one of four. All right. All right. All right, here we go. Ready? Here we go. I got to focus on one second. All right. All right. Thank you. Feel bad. That's an image you will never be able to get out of your mind now. <laughs> that cartwheel, the, do you realize that like I pulled a muscle doing that? Like it, it hurts. It, my, my body had to go into positions that it doesn't normally ever go into. My muscles, there were muscles used that aren't normally used. It was, and it looked awkward and unnatural to all of you. That's why you laughed and clapped because you felt bad for me. <laughs> okay? The reason I tell you that is this. If loving others feels as unnatural to you as that cartwheel that I just did, then you need to go back and understand the gospel and let the love of Christ drive deeper inside of you until love becomes as natural as walking. Because love is the only unmistakable mark of followers of Jesus. And so Paul says walk in love, but that's not the only thing that he says to walk in. He also says to walk in light, number two. Walk in light. So let's go on. You move down to uh, verse eight. And I think I did pinch a nerve or something. Here we go. It says, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. So, Paul says we need to walk as children of light. And the reason he says we need to walk as children of light is because do you realize that the light is the only thing that shows us the way things actually are. It shows us the truth about our life and about the world around us when the light is on it. Light exposes truth. Okay, so... Sometimes when I have to get up earlier than uh, my wife in the morning, my alarm goes off and I get up and I keep the lights off because I don't want my wife to wake up. And so trying to get ready in the dark isn't always fun uh, because you're kind of feeling your way through, I'm feeling my way through the room trying to figure out where everything is. And when it comes to getting dressed, I kind of open my closet and I can't see super well. So I try to feel what clothes I should wear and what socks I should put on, all those things. But it's not until I get all dressed and then I go out into the light that I know if I've actually done it right. And typically when I get out into the light, I see that something didn't go right. Maybe I picked the two different socks and they don't match, or maybe my shirt is inside out or something. But it's not until I go out into the light that I know exactly what the truth is. You see, it might have felt like the right clothes and like the right thing, but it's not until you get into the light that you actually see what it actually is. You see the truth about it. And that's what, that's what Paul is actually trying to say uh, in this passage. So, um, that is, <clears throat> so I think there's a lot of people walking around right now feeling their way through life. 
Feel whatever feels right, whatever makes you happy. That's what happens in the dark. Whatever feels right, whatever makes you happy, whatever seems like the right thing to do is what you do. And just because it feels right, just because you think it's right in your mind, or you're utterly convinced that everyone else is doing it, doesn't actually mean that it's right. And the only way to know if the way you're living is right is by bringing it out into the light. And when you bring it out into the light, it exposes it for exactly what it is. And I think that's why Paul, in this passage, there's certain sins that he lists. He talks about sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness, which is like greed, which is wanting more than you have, wanting something more. Uh, he talks about drunkenness. All of these sins that Paul mentions are sins. When you struggle with these sins, it's because you're feeling your way through life. You are, it, it seems like it feels good to you, like it makes you happy in the moment, so you go ahead and participate in that sin. But just because it feels right, just because it makes you happy in the moment, doesn't mean that it's right. So let me give you an example of this. Pornography. Let's use that as an example. Pornography is the one of the things, one of the sins that is probably most kept in the dark. It's a very dark thing because it's always private. And when it's kept in the dark, uh, it gets pretty ugly pretty quick and be can become an addiction. The only way, if you're, if you're going to overcome the sin of pornography, the only way to do that is to bring it out into the light, to confess it, to understand what God's word has to say about it and to see it for exactly what it is. And let me tell you what it is if you see it for exactly what it is. Here it is. Pornography is something that promises you this fulfillment, promises you some sort of insatisfaction, but never delivers and always leaves you more empty than you ever were before. And, and the more you do it, the emptier you are. And the more you do it, it leads you to actually be more insecure. It leads you to have a horrible view of the opposite sex. It leads you to bitterness. It leads you to insecurity. It leads you to anger. That's the truth about pornography. If you see it for what it is, that's where you're, that's where you're going. That's the truth. The other truth about pornography is God, what God says about it. God says, my design for sex is actually to be in a covenant of marriage. So when you view pornography, you're twisting sex to be something that I never created it to be. And you're, and, and you're twisting your whole view on humans and you're looking at humans as pieces of meat and that's not how I created it to be. That's the truth of pornography. So when you bring it out into the light and you see it for what it is, you realize exactly what happens and then you be, God begins to deal with you. You confess it and then you realize it's empty. It brings me nothing. God brings me everything and you start moving closer to the light. That's what light does. It exposes the, the reality. Here's another one, covetousness, Paul mentions in this one. Covetousness is not a word we, we go around using real often, but covetousness means greed. So greed, or it means wanting something that we don't already have. And this is a more subtle sin, but it's something a lot of us deal with where we, we, we are just unsatisfied with our lot in life or, we're, un, or we, we're unsatisfied with how much money we have or how much stuff we have. And we always want more. And, and the truth about covetousness is if you bring it out into light is that what we're saying when we are coveting is that God is not enough. That, I, that you want more because God is not enough and you are dissatisfied with who you are. But the truth is that God is satisfied with who you are and that you are more than enough, that God is more than enough for you and that Jesus has done everything that he could have ever done to save you and you could never be more loved. You could never have more than you have right now. And when covetousness is brought into the light, you see it for what it is and you go, I don't want anything to do with covetousness because God is more than enough. You start moving away from the darkness and you move towards the light, that's what happens 
when you, when you shed light on anything, it shows you the reality, the truth of it. And, uh, and the, the uh, thing that I want you guys to know is this, that the more you walk in the light, the more you see how good it is to live the way God wants you to live, the less you want to you want to sin the less you want to have anything to do with things that are not of God the more you move towards the light the more you're a child of the light the less you want to have anything to do with darkness that's why galatians 5:16 says this i love this verse it helps but i say walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh what this is saying is it doesn't say stop sinning it says Walk by the Spirit. Walk closer to the light. Grow closer to Jesus. Surround yourself with as much light as possible. It, the, the truth will be exposed, and then you will not even want to gratify the desires of the flesh anymore. What this is saying is the more you taste just how good it is to live in the light, the more you have a distaste for sin and darkness. That's the way it works. That's why Paul says in this passage, he says this, but sexual immorality and all impurity, verse three, should, must not even be named among you. And he also says, uh, he also says later in the, the passage, do not even, where is it? Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness. Paul is not being legalistic here. He's just saying, listen, when you understand how good it is to live in the light, you want nothing to even do with the darkness because you know it's leading you nowhere. And I have to give you an example of this. I had a couple in my office not too long ago and they were a young couple and they came in and they were, started to talk to me and I could tell they had just started walking with Jesus. I don't know when they first came to know Jesus, but I could tell they were walking with Jesus and here's why. Because there were all kinds of changes going on in their lives. So what happened was they were telling me their story. This couple had, right out of high school, they decided to live together. And they started living together and kind of doing their thing. And they, in the back of their minds, they knew that it probably wasn't the best idea, but, but they, they didn't care. They just started living together. And they lived together. They had a couple kids. Years later, they show up here at CCC. And when they show up here, they hear the gospel and they're being fed with the truth and the light begins to shine on them. And they're in my office going every week, week in and out, week in, week out, we're being convicted that we've got to get married. And so we are here to ask you if we can get married because we know it's the way God wants us to live. And why? Because God's light began to shine. The truth began to be exposed about the way they were living. And so they decided to get married and I'm marrying them in just a couple weeks. It's awesome. And she said to me, you know, I don't even know what's wrong with me right now because I wake up in the morning and I actually want to open God's word. I want to read scripture. And he said, I don't know what's wrong with me right now either because I usually have road rage. And uh, the last time, last time somebody cut me off, I actually thought that I should pray for them instead of get really angry. I, I know what's wrong with you. You're walking closer with Jesus. The light begins to shine on you and in exposing the truth and it's showing you what you should do and it's showing you what you shouldn't do. And it's a beautiful beautiful thing, and they're realizing that it is better to live this way. Um, the verse, the passage goes on in verse 14 and says this, therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead. It's like this, this song that Paul breaks into in the middle of this passage, and I love it because um, what Paul is saying is, listen, all right, you know what it's like to live in the light, so why aren't you doing it? What area of your life is still in the darkness that you need to wake up and bring out into the light? I have a problem. When I wake up in the morning, I love to hit the snooze button a lot, too many times than I, I'm cared to admit right now. 
And I know that at some point, my wife, she's sweet and she doesn't say anything, but I know at one point, she's, gonna, she's just gonna get in my face after it goes off for the fifth time and just say, like, wake up! You know, she's gonna get mad and annoyed by me. What is the sin in your life, the darkness in your life right now that you just keep pressing the snooze button on? Where God has been kind of showing it to you every once in a while, but you just kind of keep, keep pressing snooze on. Maybe you don't think it's that bad. Maybe you'll do it when you get older or when you grow up. Maybe it's that it is such a thing that has control over you that you don't think it's even possible to bring that out into the light. I'm telling you, today is the day to bring that out into the light so that you can see it for what it is and so that God can do his work in you. Because listen, it says, Christ's light needs to shine on you. Christ has already defeated that sin. Bring it out into the light so you can begin to battle it and get rid of it. All right, so walk in love, walk in light. Last one is that we need to walk in wisdom. Walk in wisdom. Uh, five, the verse 15. Here's what it says. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Look carefully as you walk, not as wise, not as unwise, but as wise. So we need wisdom. We need to walk in wisdom. What is wisdom? Well, wisdom, the Bible is filled with all sorts of instruction on things that we should do and things that we shouldn't do. For everything else, we need wisdom. Right? And so it goes on to tell us what different areas of our life that we need wisdom in. And the, one of the areas is, is it says we should make the best use of our time. It doesn't say how to spend our time, so we need wisdom to know what we should do. And then it says we need wisdom to know what the Lord's will is for our lives. Right? To pick a job or to pick a college, the Bible doesn't speak to that. But we need wisdom to know what we should do in those situations. It also speaks to drinking and talks about not being drunk on wine, but it doesn't say don't drink, so we need wisdom on the whole issue with alcohol that we won't even go into right now. But I think as we close, there is the, in this passage, there is the secret to how to walk in wisdom. And here it is. Starting in verse 18, it says, And do not get drunk on wine, for that is debauchery, but here's where it starts. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love this passage because it's telling us that we should sing songs to each other. And it's not like this should be one big musical. That'd be weird, All right? But what we're supposed to do is we are supposed to sing to each other the song of the gospel. And this resonates with me because I don't know if, about, about you, but I love worship. A good worship song does more in my heart and in my soul than, than any sermon I've heard. I, most of you, if, you, if I asked you to remember different sermons, it'd be hard for you to remember. But if I started singing a worship song that you knew, you could finish the line. If I started humming a melody of a worship song, you could hum along with me because that's what worship songs do for us. Here's what I think this passage is saying at the end, and the way to walk in wisdom is to allow the gospel to be like a soundtrack, like a melody, like a soundtrack in your soul, resounding all the time. And if you do that, and by the way, movies, movies have soundtracks. Do you realize how lame movies would be without soundtracks? They wouldn't, they wouldn't be what they do because soundtracks bring the movie to life. It brings a movie to life. The gospel is something that can be a melody and a song that can be put on your heart and that can be resounding in your heart as a soundtrack for your life and what it tells you is that you were dead and now you're alive that you were a pile of bones and now you are on your two feet and as you sing the song of the gospel over you you know you have the strength then to begin to walk in love and in light and in wisdom 
That's what, that's what the gospel does for us. And so we're going to close as is appropriate. I ask Ben to come up. And we're going to close with a song that, uh, that has a specific couple lines that I want to act as a soundtrack as we leave today. A melody in our heart that keeps resounding. And here it is. The song's going to say, Oh death, where is your sting? Oh hell, where is your victory? Oh church, come stand in the light. Our God is not dead. He's alive. He's alive. And we're going to sing that to God, but we're going to sing that to each other because I think that's what Paul says. The truth needs to be always on our hearts. We need to sing it to ourselves and we need to sing it to each other. And my challenge to you is to bring during this time, reflect on whatever sin you just keep pressing the snooze button on, the thing that's in the dark that you haven't brought out into the light and bring it out into the light for the first time. Expose it for what it is and see what God can do with it. And our prayer team is gonna be up here. We'd love to pray with you, talk with you, help you sort through whatever's going on. So let me have you stand, let's pray and then we'll end in worship. Father God, thank you for who you are, for your great, great love for us. Thank you that you loved us enough to send Jesus. Thank you that you gave us a way to live that brings us life. And Lord, I pray that you would show each of us today the ways that we're living in darkness that is absolutely killing us. And that we would run away from the darkness and we would run into the light, expose it for what it is and see that your way is always better. Father, do that in us now as we sing. In Christ's name, amen.